The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are actor Donald Corrin and author, artist, <laughs> Karn Knudsen. Award-winning actor Donald Corrin was born and raised in Stockton, California. <laughs> he appeared on and off-Broadway, on the stage in San Francisco, Los Angeles, San Diego, Chicago, and D.C., along with the theater at Westport, where he was directed by Joanne Woodward. Donald trained at Juilliard, and how could a boy from Central California <laughs> end up at Juilliard? Well, uh, let's see, the application process <laughs> is, uh, I applied, you know. Is that right? Did you know you wanted to go there? Was there music? Was there acting in your background? Was um, it in the family? Acting in my background. I'd been acting since I was about 10. And I was very fortunate. I had a very sophisticated theater program in high school. So I was oh. very much, we were all being very uh, kind of acceleratedly, if you will, developed. And several of us went on to a career. Is that right? Yeah. From, from that uh, mid-California, yes. what do we call it? The valley, upper it valley? It was Stockton, California. And there was, and in those days, Lincoln High School was a very kind of progressive, I guess well-funded. I didn't look at the books, but uh -huh. it was beautiful and a lot of... Um, experimental and progressive programs and a gentleman named Tom McKenzie developed a theater program where we did four and five shows a year we would run them for a month we would do them in rep we tour them everybody it was like is that right absolutely I probably got most of my training there that I certainly learned my, my respect for the so it the wasn't theater. in your background it wasn't in your family per se well music and in your family interestingly enough yes from my great-grandfather who emigrated here at the turn of the century there's a photograph of him and a group of people in, uh, on a set, and it's his acting troupe, and on the back it says, one hour before leaving for America. Oh, how great. Where was he? Odessa. Oh, he, I was in Odessa. Yeah, he was, that's yes. where he's from. Was he on the steps? I don't know. I, <laughs> was he in the Navy? <laughs> I don't know what, he came over here and started a furniture store, but throughout the generations, there's always been somebody who wanted to Odessa do it. Odessa is so beautiful, and it was built by, you know, Catherine, who came in and wanted to make it look like Paris. It was, it's really a beautiful city. Oh, I didn't know city. that. Yeah, I it's just, great. Yeah, okay, anyway, back to, back to you. Back, back to you. Um, you ended up at Juilliard, mm -hmm. and the other thing is you have nine seasons on Law and Order. <laughs> How did that happen, too? I mean, you're on the stage, you're yeah. doing everything, and you're in nine seasons of yeah. Law and Order? I, um, as it happens, I was pursuing other things at that time in my life, and um, <laughs> my, again, yes. it goes back to my family, Joan. It's, you can't escape my, my... My niece was an intern at the casting place that was doing Law and Order as her last year at... Um, Barnard, and we just were going to have lunch together. And I said, oh, that's a lunch together. We have lunch, and she says, well, you know, I'm not supposed to do this. I'm never supposed to introduce my friends or family, but it's my last day, so I will. And they're auditioning this forensic part. Do you want to come in for it? And I said, well, sure. And that was it? I went in. It was a one-day part. It was like the guy who says, oh, the, you know, the skid marks on the tires say that the car was driven at um, blah, blah. I'm yeah. that guy. Uh -huh. And always then gets the smart aleck remark, and then the scene's over. I did it. It was fine. <clears throat> About two months later, Suzanne Ryan called and said, do you want to do it again? I said, sure. About three months later, she called and said, do you want to do it again? Sure. Well, the four, on the third time, the guy had a name. He was called by name. So oh, the fourth time name. they called, I said, well, Suzanne <coughs> has a name now. Is it? Well, she said, yes, he has a name, and it went on for nine years. Is that right? And then it just stopped. And then it just stopped? There was never any long-term <laughs> anything. It just went on. And I knew everybody, and they knew me. Were it you was still the greatest gig? Were you still doing other uh, plays in between? No, or actually, did you in have those time? days, I was developing a career as a creative director and writer in the industrial market, which is what I also do. Oh, I see. I um, so I do some. TV so you writing write for people for you. You write for people who 
commercial kind of people? No. I write product oh. launches and training meetings oh, for large corporations. I direct them, create them. I also do some TV. It's like motivational speaker. Do you get um, up and teach them how to do that, too? I don't do that. You don't do that part. But we hire the people who do that. Because you'd be great. Why don't you hire yourself? All right. <laughs> Note to self, Joan says be motivational speaker. I can do that. You can do that. The you other thing, we talked, no, I can't do that. We talked about Westport, yeah. which is like, everyone says, oh, Westport, Westport Theater. Is beautiful. Why is it so great? Well, um, first of all, it has a long tradition. It was part of, this, it was part yeah. of the Straw Hat Circuit, traditionally. Oh, so it was way back. So I from, see. I don't know whether it's the 20s or the teens, but the posters backstage of Westport is just to go there and look at the Eva Legallian's production oh, of this and Mary Martin in that. They all came through, and it was a traditional old theater on that circuit. And um, Oh, I see. Joanne Woodward took over as artistic director, I guess, five, uh, blah, six, blah years yeah, ago, a whatever. A few I, years. And, um, so she directed you? How I was that? I had a that? small role in The Constant Wife. When my agent oh, said, it's right. for Joanne Woodward, I said, six lines is fine. Let's go. She's great, isn't She's she? Great. Yeah. So talking about old playhouses yeah. gets me into all the other venues, because you've done the Goodman Theater. You've yes. done the Arena t in Dallas, the Old Globe. The arena in Washington, In Washington, yeah. I'm yeah. sorry. Okay. I kept thinking, what I is know, that? The, the Alley in the Arena. The yeah, the Alley, alley in Dallas. In Dallas. Yeah. Did you do that? No. No, you didn't. <laughs> um, so, but how are those theaters all different? Because they all oh. have names of their own. How did you feel about those theaters? Oh my goodness, they're all worlds into themselves. I mean, and they all, they're regional theaters that are doing, I mean, we think about, you know, theater as just being in the major cities, but of course that's not true. There's tremendous foment of artistic and theatrical event going on. I mean, the world of, for instance, the Shakespeare Theater in Washington, oh, D.C., yes, where right. I've worked a few times with M Michael Kahn, who is one of the country's you know, top classical theater directors and designer of classical education. So that theater is all about the classics. But and we the, think of D.C. as being a big city and having a great theater. San Diego, no one thinks of that. Except and they the have, Old Globe I and know. La Jolla Playhouse. I know, and it all goes to Broadway, that's doesn't right. it? And Jack O'Brien? Jack O'Brien, and also La Jolla Playhouse just sent Jersey Boys, yes. which is the biggest They did the whole town. development there, didn't they? they I was there it. doing a show <laughs> that you're not going to hear of, Joan, <laughs> but it was, it was The Love of Three Oranges. Perhaps you have the album. <laughs> the Romanian version, yes, we did it, the Romanian version. We were all dressed in tangerine jersey silk, the same color is as the background. Is that a joke? No, this oh. is what I did. Oh, okay. And it was kind of wild and fun, but it was more of experimental. Yeah. But at the same time... Des Mackinoff was developing Jersey Boys. Oh, so you were, you were, you were close. I was close. You could have been it. You played um, this, this great place, Souvenir, at yeah. the Lyceum, yes. which is on Broadway, yes. right? And that's also the same kind of theater you're, you've been talking about. Well, it's an old traditional, right. I don't know, I think it's 1900 something. It's a Schubert theater. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, oh, it was just like being, it was just like, if ever I had a dream about what it would be like, I just touched the microphone. That's okay. Probably you heard a banging sound. <laughs> if ever I had a dream about what it would be like to open in a traditional Broadway house, I mean. That was it. So you brought Souvenir to the Brentwood. Yes, we did. Which is not, I don't think that's a big traditional theater. No, it's a newer theater, but it's in beautiful <laughs> shape with surprisingly perfect acoustics because we play a micless show. You don't have a mic? You saw a show the other day with, with no mics. Oh, it was brilliant. So tell us about Souvenir, because I thought I was going to see Judy Kay in a one-woman show about herself, and it's not. Really? I did. Oh, interesting. No, this is a show about a singer who actually existed in New York in the 30s and 40s named Florence Foster Jenkins. And I'm sure that some people who are listening know who Florence, because you can Google Florence Foster Jenkins and hear her. She was what William Hung is to American Idol, the guy who oh, sings yeah, some, yeah. so off, right? She didn't know it. And she was, uh, had de <laughs> tremendous delusions about herself that she was like the best coloratura soprano. Up on. She used to sing repertoire that Maria Callas would do. And, Queen and of the Night, <laughs> Costa Diva, um, uh, uh, you know, the laughing song, the jewel song. And she was without pitch without rhythm without musicality without anything I but with this, a I'll huge following this. yep this is one of the this, and I. what about you 
Did you? Is your character real? Yes, Cosme McMoon, the very uh, unlikely name, Cosme McMoon is his name, and he was her accompanist for 12 years. And did he really fall in love with what she was, I mean... We don't know. That's We don't know love, but did he really appreciate what she was doing? The, the, rela the actual relationship isn't known, because <coughs> there's not much history written. What is known are the dates and when they played. So Stephen Temperley, the author, which he calls a fantasia on the life of Florence Foster Jenkins, it's him musing on what would it be like if this relationship existed. A man who really is talented but can't get anywhere, and a woman who's really not talented and goes to Carnegie Hall. It's so What's amazing. It is. That was the, the amazing part of it. And it kept reminding me of Anna... Anna Russell. Anna Russell. Well, Anna Russell, of course, knew that she was funny, and she wasn't playing. Her joke wasn't that she was a bad singer. Her joke was that she would she would do these wonderful one-woman descriptions of like the Ring Cycle, Gilbert and Sullivan right. operas, and in her telling of it, it was hysterical. She'd satirize it. She'd say, "This is 24 hours long. That's why you know it's the Ring, or something yes. like that." I thought she was so funny. Oh, she's so funny. But aside from this role of yours, you're so great. You oh, play the you. piano. You I do. act. Yes, all and, of the above. And sing. Yes. You do all of those things. How did how did you get all of those together in one role? How did they cast you? I'm the luckiest guy I know. And I and I tell people who I mean, to get a role like that at this point in my career that just speaks to the specific talents and joys that I have is just something to be cherished you know you just right. you just enjoy it as long as it lasts and you get as much as you can out of it and you're a cabaret singer I am and y you're like Gershwin Cole Porter the Tin Pan Alley stuff yeah, yeah. and yeah. so do you know all of those songs oh, yeah. and you can play them on the piano yes I used to play when I was in school and then for several years after to supplement my income I would play uh. I was what we called a saloon singer oh yeah so that I, was I'd great. be the guy in the back you know I'd be this guy Playing at the club. Who would never get to a level where he could be there himself. But when Judy Kay's character gets to Carnegie Hall, you were saying, your character, well, I'm playing in Carnegie I'm pl Hall. He's my god. My, I'm up there with Brahms, <laughs> he says. I'm playing. You know. And the audience, of course, is hooting and hollering, but they're hiding that they're deriding her. Yes. They're yelling bravo yelling bravo so they all play along and but that's historically true that's how it happened was it and oh, that yes. was your voiceover and the way you told the story right. in other words it was so good it's Do a you, wonderful play it's wonderful it's just, i'm loving taking it around as we are and and what about this martha stewart thing before we leave did you cook with her no, did you well, act with her I, I was martha stewart's writer and um kind of um, coach on set for two years, for seasons two and three. It was a wonderful job. Oh. I wrote her scripts, worked with all the research person, and then I delivered her content to her on set and also uh, worked with her on her performance. And so I was right in her face for two years. It was great. Well, you've done some She's really... She's a wild thing. That you've Mr. done some great things I with have. wild people. Donald Corrin, I'm so happy you came on today. Joan, thank you for having me. I thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. And don't go away. We'll be right back with Karn Knudsen and her Shoology book. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Author, artist, Karn Knudsen started her career in Minnesota as a creative director of an advertising agency. What were your duties there? Uh, making ads for pretty much everything, including spam. Making lunch ads? Mat. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, television, print, pretty much anything the client needed to sell something, that's what I did. And had a bunch of people reporting to me and ran around. Did awesome. you go to school to learn that? I did. I have a background in graphic design oh, and that's studied it. psychology to go along with it. So. And you know, our show airs in St. Paul, Duluth, Minnesota area. Wisconsin. Excellent. We'll have lots of family that'll be really happy <laughs> to hear about that. They'll be sitting there going, oh my. <laughs> Our hometown girl is here. <laughs> exactly. She made good. Why did you move to San Francisco from 
Minnesota. Uh, Were you in Minneapolis? I was in Minneapolis. Uh -huh. I lived there for quite a while. And finally, one day, I just decided that I didn't want to get to the end of my life and go, I wonder what would happen if really? I tried. Yeah, That's because, very gutsy. Yeah, it was one of those things where just like, I want to try it. So being an artist and a writer full time, that's what I wanted to pursue, so I quit my job one day and said, I'm moving, and pick San Francisco. So d were you riding there then? When you I, got there, were you, did you get a job riding? When I got to San Francisco? Uh -huh. No, I, I'm purely on my own. It's really, I'm an artist and a writer, you know, oh, just you freelance, are. and I write books and make art, and that's what I'm doing. I don't have a day job right now. But you were, but you had the connections through your ad agency, I bet. Did you to make to get a book publisher and to do things like that? No, actually, it was. <laughs> no. I know, I know. You'd think I could parlay all those years into something, but it, the book came out of very fun. A good friend of mine, his aunt, is a publisher, and we were having lunch one day, and got talking, and I started talking about some illustrations and these funny per, um, observations of my girlfriends and their very shoey behavior. And I started talking about it'd be fun to do a book about the psychology of shoes. And they go, really? <laughs> it would be. So that's how you started? That's how it started. And how did you do the research? I spent, well, all my years in advertising you know, taught me to pay attention to people and figure out how to sell them things by what they have and what they did. So I took that and sort of twisted it around and sat in coffee shops for many days and hours and months. That was your research? That was <laughs> most of my research, going through stores, you know, kind of watching people pretending to shop and just seeing what they were doing and seeing what people were wearing and what they were doing. And then what about the colors? Because the color is so great. I love this. It just pops, yeah. doesn't it? Well, that's, it's kind of the idea of, you know, when we see shoes that we like, the whole thing is like, ooh, they're so cute. And my artwork is very vibrant. And it's always been a thing where about feeling good. To me, my artwork, I like it to be joyful and have fun. So translating the ideas of the shoes into fun colors it's just that idea of, oh, I'd love to wear that. I might never, I might buy it in black. I might not actually wear it in fuchsia. But the idea of it in fuchsia is really fun. So this is one of the pages. I'm going to hold this up and then, because each shoe has a story about it. Did you write all yes. the stories? I wrote, I wrote everything front to back. Tell us, like, start with uh, th this one over here. Uh, color blinded. This is, <laughs> this is actually inspired by a friend of mine who has her signature color. She will go shopping and buy anything, including many pairs of shoes, in her signature color. It doesn't matter if it goes with anything or if it, you know, fits or whatever. It's her color. So oh. she must have it, you know. And, and these? Beaded Love is... Beaded a, Love. Each one has a name. Yes, so they have a name the and names, they have personal. Because I think they're great. Beaded Love is uh, one of those things. It's, it's those great shoes. Like, you find that classic, amazing shoe. You probably spent way too much on it, but you love it. It's beautiful. And you will gladly walk, you know, out to the curb, hail a cab to go to the <laughs> restaurant that's three blocks away because you would not risk Walking damaging shoes. these poor <laughs> shoes. Not to mention, you probably can't walk in them. But yes, yeah, so that's beaded love. And then the other one was called the closet stripper. The closet stripper, <laughs> where, you know, it's like, ladies, we all have those shoes in our closet that it's, you, you bring them out every once in a while when you're feeling a little bit extra, you know, I got it. sexy. And generally, it's a pretty clear statement for anyone when, when you put them here's on. Here's three more. <laughs> and the reason I'm, I'm showing these is because, is it really about the shoe or is it about personality. Well, the the fun thing about shoes is women, we mostly know, and I've never figured out why men haven't quite figured this out about us, is we can change our personality just by changing our shoe. Yeah. And the most important thing about a shoe is we feel, it makes us feel good about ourselves when we're wearing them. If, like the pain inflictor, for example, this is a great kind of shoe. You see it a lot. Pain in inflictor. Pain inflictor. <laughs> but so many shoes can be pain uh, inflictors. <laughs> <laughs> but these are the ones you are super, super pointy with those great stiletto oh. heels. And it's a wonderful thing when you find it in the office, because generally it's a very powerful woman, and she'll have these on, and it makes it very clear walking into a boardroom. Okay. It's like, do you understand? I have a weapon on my foot, so don't mess with me. So that's kind of the, the idea behind the pain. So pain those pressure. are the personality parts. Mm -hmm. Do you have a collection of shoes? I, I myself, yes. I'm terrible. I'm the person that doesn't get noticed. My friends have actually threatened, like, I had to go get new shoes. They're like, these are terrible. You're going to a wedding. You have to get new shoes. But I bought, brought some things with me. These are some of the shoes I actually went and, like. <laughs> She's pulling them out of her I bag. got shoes. Pulled them up to you slowly. So slowly. That you, yes, okay, okay yeah, good. Th this is a bit of a pain inflictor. So, um, like, this is, 
I took this out of my friend's closet. I went and raided them. The closet stripper. This is a classic example of. Uh, she actually says she feels a little naked when she puts this Let shoe on. Yeah. <laughs> you know things like this that my friends are like. I don't know why I bought it, but you know it's shiny and it's pretty, and you know it's like have and you it's ever beaded, worn? right? Yeah, exactly. It's beaded and it's sparkly and those kind of things. But yeah, so I just you know it's like the wee, the classic wee. Great thing about a wedge is it puts a little extra swing in your step because it gives you a little more stability. <laughs> so I always love seeing my girlfriends who are a little bit shy and they put on a wedge and suddenly you know they've got a little catwalk in them. <laughs> it's great. That's what I love about shoes. You know the things are like equal opportunity bling. It's like is, if you are could, these all in your book. These are all in my book. Equal opportunity bling. It's that thing. It's like it's shiny and it's sparkly. And if we could get them in real diamonds, we would. But you know, it's just a little frivolous. But, yeah. but yes. And, you buy, and did you actually draw from? You drew from these real shoes. I. What I did is I observed lots of shoes and went digging through my friends. This is so ugly. This is like what I like to wear. Comfortable. It's, this is hysterical. <laughs> this is this is what we call the lunch lady look. It's comfortable, but it looks like basically a mashed potato on your foot. The funny thing is, is this a girlfriend of mine bought it because she's color blinded. Anything in turquoise, she will buy. And oh. all, she bought these. She's running around. and She goes, "I'm wearing a pair of lunch lady shoes." I'm like, "Yes, you are." She goes, "But they're they're turquoise." But does that remind you of this, the lunch lady shoe? No, this is oh, what this I consider. Doesn't remind no, how it did to me. No, this is considered nerd sexy. Oh dear! But because it's really great, this is like this is a great example of kind of nerd sexy. It's it's just a classic that pump. That is. You can get away with this at work, but it would be just a standard style shoe, except for the fact that it's pony and it has an animal pattern on it. So yeah. that's the sexy part. So st I standard see. pump, okay. but something a little different compared to. Well, this nerd sexy, the idea of it's a loafer, but if you have a green alligator skin loafer, uh, it's a little cooler than just something brown. I see, you know? <laughs> I see. What else do you have in your bag? In my bag. Um, this is a great example of what we call the, um, the sporty sorts. Another comfortable shoe. Yes, but my girlfriend bought it just because it was a cool shoe, and then she realized that it's a boxing shoe, but she didn't oh. actually do boxing, <laughs> but she just bought it because it was a cool shoe. <laughs> And so people are like, oh, are you a boxer? And she's like, no, but I just, I like the they shoe. They knew they were boxer shoes. They knew that they, they were boxing shoes. <laughs> she didn't, but, you know, it's like. And yes. you have a, you have a boot. Oh, yes. Oh, please, because that's beautiful. <laughs> that's that's great. a beautiful piece. That's great. Boots are so fun, because the minute you put boots on, everyone kind of knows, like, okay, I'm out for a little fun. There's just something really powerful about putting on boots. And when you put in something like this, it's just very clear. It's sort of giddy up. Let's have fun, because you've got this pony, total, you know, cowboy. Do you Go need up. a cowboy hat with that one? No, but a nice pair of jeans work really good, oh, you know, I if, they, if well, they see, show that, off your ass. That puts you into a whole different mood, doesn't it? Yes. And that's the great thing, you know. And the pink shoe you didn't show us. Show us that. This that's one. So pretty. This is totally ladies who lunch. Mm -hmm. Kind of shoe, very stylish. You know, the manicure probably matches, and you know, open the wallet, and you know, everything's the same color. Yeah. Well, but in a very subtle way, because you know, it's it's about ladies who lunch, so we have to have everything very subtly matching. I like that. Yes. And this one, this one looks no, this, the black this, patent. Ah, isn't this great? Patent wow. is such a fun thing. That's all over Europe now, yes. and all over these big, huge. Yeah. And um, what's so fun is platformy like, shoes. And it's a great thing because with this great, you know, the bring back the little front platform is, you know, when you want to feel just a little bit sexy, put on patent because anything oh, patent. Like, you put on patent leather, you got this little peep toe going on, and you know that the ladies are out there going, hmm, yes, it's like this I is this is what I put on to be sexy. <laughs> <laughs> this fuzzy, oh, the this fuzzy, fuzzy slippers. Shoe. What is this? <laughs> well, that's that's our fuzzy refuge because like every lady who spends her day running around and let this, you get home, these go off, and your refuge goes on. It's like we love these. These are like our best friends. They don't exactly. scuff. There's no buckles. It doesn't pinch. And they're cute. And they're cute. Yeah. <laughs> And they're great, you know, you curl up on the couch, got your rocky row and your cuffy slippers and life is good because that's what they're supposed to be. They're Aside from doing, making shoes and mm -hmm. making, book, doing mm -hmm. books, you are an artist and I have yes. a couple of, of your art pieces yes. here. Yes, I do, um, as you can see, I do figurative abstract Rather expressionism. Rather than uh, illustrations, yeah. we're talking about illustrations mm -hmm. compared to the, my Salvador art, yes. Dali. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and these are very, very small. Um, examples of my work. Normally my work is, is much bigger. Um, again, I my fine art is all about bringing joy and sharing smiles with people. So, so this is called? This is actually a panel out of um, uh, the Queen Lady in Shadow Man. 
And this one? And this is one of the City Girl, and she is oh, uh, like this. with she her bouquet. She looks like a nun. Oh, no, no, <laughs> the City Girl. She, she would be wearing this. Oh, she would? <laughs> This girl here with City Girl. <laughs> Actually, City Girl is my next book that'll be coming out next year is City Girl Philosophy. Oh, I was gonna ask you what's yes. coming up next. You know why? I was thinking, are gloves next? Are sweaters next? Mm -hmm. What kind of accessories are next? Well, one of the things, City Girl Philosophy is the next thing, and that's how to live a fabulously color-coordinated life. Uh, and we move up from the ankle to everything, you know, shopping, love dating, and other things requiring heels, that kind of world, and her take on everything. After that, one of the, one of the things I'm starting to work on is possibly doing accessorology. And <laughs> we're <laughs> we need to have that. I know. It's like, what, what does this bracelet tell you about me? So, but that, gloves, nobody talks about gloves, and I they're kind of like shoes. They tell a story, too, I, don't they? Well, accessories all together tell some really wonderful things. And it's funny because a lot of people don't, you know, they think of accessories as just as, oh, my jewelry or my shoes. Yes. But really, the great thing about accessories is your hairstyle is an accessory. How you wear your makeup is an accessory. Your car is an accessory. So everything in our well, life that's going to be a big thing. I uh, know. <laughs> So right now we're like, okay, are we going to cut this down? What are we going to do? So I've just started working on, on that one and kind of putting things together. Are you looking. doing the drawings? How do you start on the book? Um, I generally start with um, little tiny doodles. I, I, have, I have these little, little journals that I carry around, and if ah. I see things, I jot down these goofy little doodles of a shoe and usually the name of the shoe, like what the personality first comes to mind. Oh, right, I see. And then I sit down and start writing a story that kind of goes with the personality. And that'll be the same thing with your person. Yeah. What do we call her? City Girl. City Girl. City Girl philosophy. Okay. I yes. want to be in City Girl. <laughs> I want to be a city girl. Well, the great thing is city girl, everybody can be. There's a little c inner a little city, girl city girl in all of us. I even, my, one of my, my sister-in-law, she's like, I live in the country. I go, honey, you got city girl in you. I've seen you shop. You have city girl People in you. People who know how to shop. <laughs> you know how to shop, know how to, anyone who can sit down with their girlfriend and go, honey, it's like, oh, tell me about it. You qualify as a city girl. It's kind of that personality. It's like you love life. You have a little bit cheeky attitude to it. You have a little inner diva. You may not bring it out uh, that much. Exactly. I like it. And I'm so glad you came <laughs> down from San Francisco to be with us. Well, I'm so glad you had Karen, me. Karen, thanks very much. And Thank thanks you. for shoeology. We love that. And, and thanks for watching. Keep riding to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles, 90017. I'm going to show the back of this one.